Well, welcome, everybody. Uh, I know some people are still coming in, but um, hopefully you've joined uh, What Was I Thinking? Bungled Breach Responses, uh, because that's what we're going to be talking about today, which we hope will be informative, fun, and interesting presentation. The, the basic premise of uh, the presentation is and the discussion is that breaches in today's day and age are really unavoidable, but there's a lot of things that uh, companies do to make their problems worse, which are avoidable with a little bit of thought and planning. And so we will um, be talking through issues like uh, undisciplined communications, uh, failure to anticipate evidentiary privilege issues with um, production of reports, concealing the truth from federal investigators and more, um, all designed to help you um, when you go back to your uh, day jobs, think about things where you can help your own companies avoid these problems uh, and make their, make their own problem, problems for themselves worse than they were before. Um, so uh, I'm joined by two really distinguished colleagues uh, and knowledgeable people um, uh, on this topic. First is Anne-Marie Mortimer. Anne, would you like to introduce yourself? Hi, I'm Anne-Marie Mortimer. I am a partner with Hunt and Andrews Kurth. I co-lead the commercial litigation practice there, where my practice focuses on consumer risk litigation, including data breach class actions. Excellent. And a couple of things you left out is that you were named a top cyber lawyer in California in the Daily Journal um, just last year. And you were named an MVP in cybersecurity and privacy uh, by Law 360 just last year as well. So quite, quite the list of accolades. So, Anne, great to have you here. Thank you for joining us. Uh, Brian, do you want to introduce yourself? Sure. My name is Brian Levine. Pleasure to be with you all to join you today. Uh, I'm Managing Director of EY's Transaction Cybersecurity and Data Privacy Practice, which is a group of 30 cybersecurity and data privacy professionals that work on mergers and acquisitions, divestitures, restructuring, going public, going private, just about every type of transaction. And I joined EY about two years ago from the US Department of Justice where I was a cybercrime prosecutor and national coordinator for the other 300 cybercrime prosecutors around the country. Prior to that, I was a assistant attorney general with the New York Attorney General's office in their Internet and Technology Bureau. And prior to that, I spent about 10 years doing technology litigation with a variety of large firms, including Morrison and Forrester in Palo Alto, better known as MoFo, and Paul Weiss in New York, which doesn't have a snappy abbreviation. But uh, pleasure, to, pleasure to join you all today. Okay, a few things you left out too, Brian. One, swing dancer. <laughs> you're a swing dancer and you're a musical comedy writer. True. Yeah, <laughs> everyone should know that. Uh, you've also received the John Marshall Attorney General's Award and the Executive U.S. Attorney's Office Award for Superior Litigative Team and the Assistant Attorney General's Award for Exceptional Service. So, Thank you. Thanks for mentioning those, Jeff. Of course. <laughs> Uh, we have to establish our credibility if we want people to stay in the session. And I'm, I'm John Hauser. Um, I'm a principal here at the firm. I co-lead our uh, mergers and acquisitions, cybersecurity and data privacy practice with Brian. Um, I'm a former FBI agent and federal prosecutor. I worked cybercrime cases in the second half of my uh, government career to include um, one of the first ever indictments of nation state hacking group. Um, overseas, um, work with the National Security Council on um, an executive order, which could be used to uh, go after the bad guys overseas um, and a number of other criminal investigations as well. So great having you here. So let's um, uh, take one quick pause uh, to talk about logistics. Um, if you have questions, feel free to submit those to us. We're happy to field those as we go along. Uh, I don't need to wait until the end. Um, so, uh, again, feel free to jump in with those, um, on slides. We're not planning on using the slides as part of the presentation. Um, I think there's, there is some good content in there, including relevant case law, uh, and some actionable suggestions that we created, um, which you can take home to your companies. Those will be available in the next couple of weeks for you to use, but, uh, we decided that the slides would be a bit of a distraction. Uh, and we'd rather just focus on the conversation since there's a lot of great content for us to just talk through with you. 
Okay, uh, let's jump into the first topic um, in the presentation, which relates to breach communications, uh, meaning the communications that an internal security team or an in-house corporate team would be using when they're talking to each other um, in the uh, before, during, or after a, a breach. Um, and so, Anne Marie, this is I know an area where you've seen a lot of this play out um, as you've had to defend clients who've been subject of lawsuits. Um, so what sort of information are you seeing plaintiff's attorneys asking for um, from companies? Yeah, so really most plaintiff's attorneys are casting a very wide net when it comes to discovery. So they're going to ask for the dreaded, quote, all information. And what that means is we're not just talking about formal reports or considered communications. We're talking about communications that happen in the heat of the moment of a security incident. So remember, when you're using your Slack or your text or any other app, you're not writing in invisible ink. Those things are actually going to be produced in a litigation. And while it's hard to adopt that mindset in the moment, you need to start disciplining yourself now so that when you get to litigation, an email you fired off in the heat of the moment doesn't come back to haunt you in a deposition where suddenly you find yourself center stage being deposed and asked questions about an email that you never intended to have significance it later takes on. Yeah, absolutely. I think, you know, people have trained themselves to think of emails and things like that as, as uh, discoverable, but um, not some of the other real-time communications that you were mentioning. Um, and so I'm sure that can lead to big mistakes. And I know well, you've seen, I've not, seen, not my you clients, know. of course, John, because my clients no. are very careful <laughs> about their communications. But you heard but, about it. Yeah. <laughs> but, in yeah. general, these off-channel forms of communication can be real gold for uh, someone trying to reconstruct a scenario, particularly that the company was already aware of a security vulnerability or didn't respond adequately or quickly enough. So the kinds of things you think about when you worry about that are sort of the heat of the moment gallows humor, which is very common in security teams but I know you folks don't like to meet with the lawyers and the quickest way you find yourself in front of a lawyer is firing off one of those texts or Slack channels that talk about, I don't know, your security being like Swiss cheese or gee, this is happening again or anything that refers to either the security posture of the company in a way that's negative or could be perceived as negative. Anything that refers to the threat as recurring or anticipated. I mean, remember, maybe even five words end up having a consequence that you never intended to attach to them. So before you hit send on that message, think to yourself, how would I feel if that was blown up into giant font and posted in the middle of Times Square? Would I be comfortable with that communication? Because that's the standard almost that you need to adopt every time you make a communication. And the hardest part of the rule I'm sharing with you is that it's not just from the moment of breach forward. Remember that litigation reaches back into the history because part of what's looking through a filter of 2020 is what did the company know and when and how did it generally address its security posture? So really, even if you're not in, in battle mode, but you're just joking around with your colleagues, those things too can come back to haunt you in a way that uh, believe me, you'll not appreciate later if you find yourself in the hot seat of a deposition. I've been telling management about this issue for months or years, right? That's another good one um, that can come back to haunt people. And have you seen that play out, Anne, um, in the course of... Uh, yeah. Of the yeah. And it's not unique, by the way, to uh, cybersecurity litigation. I sure. think this is, this is just something that litigators always fear, you know, the dreaded email that comes out and a stack of even millions of pages may be produced, but it can all come down to a handful of communications that while you can try to put context around, you can't fully erase. So again, the best we can do is be very mindful and what I, what I call uh, communication hygiene. It is something that I think really, and it's not entirely fair to expect from a security team who typically is not involved in litigation. So I think the company does itself a big favor to have these conversations outside the heat of battle, to give some specific examples of how communications can hurt and sort of try to train people in advance about being mindful in their communications. 
Yeah, makes sense. Uh, Brian, anything you've seen on the communication side that you want to share from any of your experiences? Yeah, so, you know, sometimes it's not the specific words you use, but the tone, and the tone is often toxic. Um, and, you know, people just can be nervous in these situations, and some of the nervousness or whatever other emotions are involved will just come out in their texts, in their emails. Um, and, you know, I've seen numerous instances where, uh, you know, a case was going nowhere. It was going to be dismissed at the motion to dismiss stage or was dismissed at the motion to dismiss stage. And then for whatever reason, emails became exposed. Maybe there was a government investigation going on subsequent, you know, on a parallel track and they released uh, some emails or they issued a report that had some emails um, or for whatever reason, emails come out and the civil litigation ends up doing a, you know, 180 and, you know, now everything is looking bad and now it's going to head towards settlement because even though there's, there's, it's only smoke, it's not fire. Um, the smoke is enough that the, the company doesn't really want to take the risk of going to trial and giving it further publicity. Um, so it does matter. And, you know, the other, another reason it matters is not just for the litigation. What's, what's a little bit unusual about the breach context or the security context is if you've had a breach or other security uh, incident, it's possible that the criminal is listening, is monitoring your communications via email or via, uh, you know, anything that's uh, over the computer text. If it's a company issued mobile device, theoretically the mobile device as well. Um, and that may interfere with your ability to negotiate effectively with the criminal. So it, as a hypothetical, if it's a ransomware situation, um, the bigger a, a deal it seems like to the criminal based on your reaction to it, the higher the price may go. Uh, and so uh, maybe it will help your uh, incident, your, your people in the in-house and people involved in incident response, the IT people, whoever is involved in the discussions to understand that their communications may be being monitored real time by the criminal. And they may think that's not happening because they say, oh, it's all contained to this one little piece, but it happens many times that that's what we think initially. And then it, we realize it expands out. The breach is much larger than they anticipate. Yeah, I agree. Absolutely, Brian. And, and so that's an important thought to have in mind too, which is you should treat your communications not only like they might be published eventually, but they might be being monitored, particularly as it affects your ability to remediate whatever the security incident is. Yeah, absolutely. I saw we did have a question come in about um, communications to affected customers um, or outside the organization. Um, and are, are there any best practices around that or, or horror stories around that? I, <laughs> well, there's probably both, but yeah. I think here it's a tension and there's no one easy answer, right? Because the competing tension is you want to communicate in a timely fashion with the stakeholders. And that's all your stakeholders. That's your potentially impacted business partners. It's your consumers. If you have a consumer base it's the regulator. So you have to consider all these competing stakeholders and the clock starts running right from the moment you become aware of a breach and everyone's going to look. And by the way, there's litigation consequences to whether or not you uh, uh, delayed notification. So on the one hand, you're under pressure to deliver a message in a timely way. But the competing or counterbalance pressures, you want to be accurate in those communications, right? Because you lose credibility and sometimes you overstate or understate the incident if you're working on limited information. So it's a good question. And it's one though that can't be answered with a one size fit all answer. I think at the end of the day, it's a balance. And, and I, I would put strike the balance in, yes, be mindful of the time clock and don't, don't delay in too long before responding, but try to get some information to make sure you feel relatively certain. And then in the communication, be transparent about the fact that the facts are continuing to evolve. So leave yourself some room if different facts develop, but timeliness, accuracy, and transparency are key rules when communicating with your stakeholders. 
Yeah. And we'll touch a little bit on this. Uh, another good example of uh, communications outside of the enterprise. Um, we'll, we'll touch on the Uber indictments uh, a little bit later on, uh, where there were some communications from the internal security team to, uh, to actually to the bad guys, uh, which is hard to rely on the bad guys to keep that sort of thing secret um, if it comes down to it. Okay, great. Um, let's jump to the next uh, topic, which is incident response, incident response reports, the reports that are uh, inevitably prepared um, in the wake of an incident when um, a, a response team would come in and typically um, would describe how the attack happened, um, what security flaws led to the attack, and then what companies need to be doing about um, that. And there's been a lot of litigation around um, whether or not those reports um, are, are um, privileged or whether they are discoverable by, by plaintiff's attorneys. So, Brian, can you um, lay out for us what, what the concerns are with incident response reports? Yeah, it's a great question. You know, uh, Ralph the Dog uh, in the original Muppet movie sang a song called You Can't Live With Them, You Can't <laughs> Live Without Them. And I think that that song was probably about incident response reports. I haven't watched the movie in a long time, but that's, probably. I think that's probably right. Um, and, and, the, and the problem with incident response reports, there are many, but I think the short answer is, look, they're not always carefully written. Um, they may be preliminary, and, they, and so they might not be completely accurate, as Anne-Marie suggested, about initial impressions. Uh, they may tend to suggest blame, you know, blame for the incident, which is really unhelpful. They may identify a bunch of things that the company should have done, but didn't do. Um, and they may go beyond where they need to go. So as a result, plaintiffs in a data breach suit are almost always going to request a copy of any incident response reports in discovery. And that can be a problem. Okay. And um, are the plaintiffs successful in getting those incident response reports turned over? Yes. Yeah, so the problem is generally, yes, they are successful. Um, the company will frequently assert work product protection and or uh, attorney client privilege. Uh, and sometimes there are other arguments as well. But these arguments have generally failed. It's generally an uphill battle to protect these and, and why is that? I mean, you, obviously, we you know we know that these incident response reports are prepared in anticipation of a lawsuit coming, right? There's typically at the direction of counsel. So, what what is the issue with uh, you know extending the privilege to these types of reports? Well, you, you said it right there. So, as to establish work product pri privilege, courts generally require that the report be prepared in anticipation of litigation, and while you might have that opinion that it was prepared in anticipation of litigation, in my experience, courts generally find that these reports were not prepared in anticipation of litigation. And that's because they seem to find that these reports would have been prepared anyway. Uh, in other words, but for any anticipated litigation, they still would have been prepared. Uh, and, and there's some logic to that because, you know, for business reasons, you often do need these reports. You need to uh, figure out what happened and you need to take appropriate steps to remediate it and move forward. And that might be true regardless of whether there was any litigation. Uh, but the courts tend to focus on a couple, of, a couple of questions to try and decide whether it was prepared in anticipation of litigation. First, who requested the report and under what circumstances? You know, the further away the litigation counsel is from requesting the report and the further away it is from any actual litigation, the that factor tends to, to move against finding the privilege here or the protection. Um, second question is, what does the report cover? If the report reads as though it was prepared uh, and would have been prepared, in the exact same form, whether there was any litigation or not, that doesn't help the case for work product pr uh, protection. And then who is the report provided to? Is it provided just to counsel um, and, and, and management perhaps inside and outside counsel, or is it you know, provided to a bunch of third parties and the IT organization, which courts seem to use to suggest uh, you know, that wouldn't support the pr protection as well. So in general, these arguments have failed. 
Okay. And, and the anticipation of litigation point is interesting because, uh, as I think you already said, you know, it's uh, even if it is prepared in anticipation of litigation, um, if there's another reason why the report is prepared, then that argument, it sounds like, will fail. It needs to be prepared. There's a because um, aspect to this, right, where the, the report needs to be because of uh, litigation and not for another business, ordinary business purpose, uh, which is where companies are running afoul of trying to protect their defense attorneys are trying to um, are running afoul of trying to protect these reports from uh, the privilege. I so mean, I don't want to be quite so bleak. There are times in which you can mount a successful privilege defense, but I think Brian's exactly right that, you know, there are landmines and you have to navigate it properly. And yeah. when it comes to the actual facts underlying the incident, those facts are not going to be privileged and, and understandably so because the, def the defendant or the company will have in its possession facts that are only available to them that the plaintiffs need to know in order to understand what happened and they are entitled to ask for those facts. And I also understand, John, your point about litigation kind of follows a breach as surely as night follows day. So should it be in the anticipation right. of litigation? Yes, I think there are arguments there. But I think it also depends on who's requested it, whether you're using, for instance, the same security firm you, you have on standby retainer anyways, or if there are different steps you're taking that make it clear that this is a different kind of report. And in thinking about the content of the report, too, and understanding that you are going to have to disclose the facts, you know, my preference and John, you'll you'll appreciate what I'm saying here is it's a dragnet approach, just the facts, ma'am. You know, right. if you right. want understanding that you will be producing something in your data breach litigation, it's good to have available to you a report that is just the facts. In other words, it doesn't have things like extraneous assessments, doesn't have what counsels asked you to do. It doesn't have recommendations that aren't core to the actual underlying facts of the breach. So I think there are two issues here, and, and you're going to hear me say a lot, they're competing concerns. There always are. There's an operational need to understand what's happened and to deal with what's happened and to have those facts at the ready. Understood that. But separating out uh, the operational piece of it, including that part about remediation and, and self-reflection from the underlying facts is a good hygiene practice because you don't want to face some of these battles that Brian's talking about, which, and I agree overall, the scorecard's not, not positive for uh, maintaining privilege. So those are things you should have in mind when considering what's the scope and purpose of this security report. Yeah, so I also have a couple of approaches that I think can improve your chances uh, of, of having a protected report or having most of it protected in the situation. So the first option is to don't get a written report. And, uh, you know, while that might seem impractical, um, you know, I've assessed about 150 companies in the last year in terms of their security, and I've been, many of them have had incidents, and most of them don't get a written report. So you don't always need a written report. You can have the incident responder do a Zoom session just like this, go over their findings. You or your attorney can take notes uh, on the key points. Um, and so you don't actually need a, a formal written report in every situation. Now, if you do get an incident, uh, incident report, here's a couple of ideas. One, um, consider having the incident responder retained and directed very closely by the law firm. Uh, based on the factors the courts look at, um, that seems to help in getting uh, a, a work product privilege report. Um, second, consider framing the substance of the report on the affirmative or defensive litigation. And, and I want to explain what I mean by affirmative defensive litigation. Uh, defensive litigation is what we're usually thinking of when we're thinking of breaches. Like you have a breach or your client has a breach, you're going to be sued. Yes, that's probably inevitable. But if you write the report around that, the whole report is going to sound defensive. Instead, why not assume that your client may want to sue the hacker instead of, or the insider, instead of taking a defensive position? And more and more clients are going after the hacker or the insider or, or whatever. And, and there are a variety of reasons to do that. One, 
um, is that it kind of shifts the optics of the situation from this being your fault to this being a criminal action and you're going to take steps against the attacker. The other reason they do it is if you bring litiga affirmative litigation, you can potentially take steps to identify who the hacker is, which can help any criminal prosecution or potentially help you ultimately recover. So there's a reason to bring affirmative litigation. And if you frame the report in terms of a possible affirmative litigation, you can make it clear to the judge that this isn't in anticipation of litigation. And so the sections of that report might be a description of the interview, very neutral, as Anne-Marie suggested, the physical locations involved, which would be relevant to jurisdiction or venue, the evidence, where is it located? Has it been preserved? What needs to happen to preserve it? Who are the witnesses? What information do we have about out attribution? In other words, is this IP address implicated? Um, and then what are the potential discovery requests? So if the IP address goes back to Verizon, the first potential discovery request would be a subpoena to Verizon to get more information about the subscriber of that IP address. So kind of framing the whole thing in terms of affirmative litigation, I think will make it very clear to the judge that this report was prepared in anticipation of litigation. The other thing I, I would suggest is consider separate, separating out the remediations into a separate report. Um, and, and what I would really suggest is just don't worry about the remediations in that report, in the initial report. You know, yeah. ask what you need to do to stop the bleeding, but instead just wait and get a complete cybersecurity assessment, which you should be doing anyway. And when you get that complete cybersecurity assessment, don't have them address the incident. Just say, what is going, you know, what are you doing right? And what additional protections you could have? Now that subsequent report, which would just be a security assessment, may be protected under federal rule of evidence 407 for subsequent remedial measures. It may not be admissible at trial or maybe not even on summary judgment motion. It will be discoverable most likely, um, but, it probably won't come in at trial under subsequent remedial measures, or at least you'll have the argument. So that's another thing you could do. And, and the final thing I would say, no matter which approach you take, consider having the report, uh, a draft of the report, reviewed very closely by an attorney to ensure it doesn't include any unnecessary or unhelpful content before it's finalized. Yeah, all, all really good suggestions and and Brian um, about how to sort of uncloud uh, what the purpose of the report is uh, and how it's framed and who it's shared with um, to better protect that privilege. Um, you know, we have a couple cases in the slides uh, that will when when you're able to download those that I think will be instructive on this point. Um, it's you know it, it, the immediate reaction is from these rulings is it seems like companies are being punished for doing the right thing, right? Where they're getting an incident response report um, uh, and then they're subjecting themselves to litigation, their um, risk by, by, by doing that. Um, but I think this has been a very good discussion where you can sort of walk that line um, about getting the information you need, but also um, not making it easier than you need to for the other side to get that information. So really good discussion. Um, okay, let's take a break from uh, bungling for a second. Uh, let's talk about uh, some things that companies are, are doing right. Um, and as you know, as we've already discussed, you do a lot of this type of litigation. So what are companies doing well to protect themselves uh, from the uh, night follows day lawsuit that you mentioned? You know, I think the first thing companies can do is to prepare themselves because for most companies, it's not a question of uh, if you're going to get breached, it's, it's when. And that doesn't indicate, you know, I think that there's a huge fallacy built into uh, the data breach litigation, which is somehow your security was inadequate or not robust simply because of there's a breach. I think that underestimates the sophistication and tenaciousness of the hackers, you know, and the fact that the hackers, uh, the defenders have to be right 24 seven where the hackers can get it right just once. So the fact of a breach doesn't indicate inadequate security. It doesn't indicate a lack of focus on security. And at the end of the day, security as this group will understand is not a destination. It's a process with ever evolving threats. So I think understanding thematically and not being defensive from that is the starting point. 
but understanding it doesn't mean you should prepare for it. It means just the opposite. You should prepare. Here's where the, you know, Boy Scout motto has it right about being prepared. Companies need to build in a certain amount of muscle memory so that they're prepared if and when it happens to them. What do I mean by that? I mean that first you need to make sure you have a focus on your data management so you know what's out there, what can't be compromised. I think you have to have an appropriate governance structure so you can have the communication chain ready. The security team obviously needs to know what to do and have a response plan in place to follow. And that plan though, you know, should be sufficiently flexible to scale to the size of an event. One thing you see, for instance, in breaches is that the plaintiff's counsel will take out your incident response plan, put it in front of the security team and say, starting from top to bottom, did you do this? Did you do this? Did you do this? And there may be very good reasons in a particular incidence where you deviated from your plan, but the plan should have flexibility to allow for that because uh, sort of it becomes an unnecessary gotcha moment in litigation. So I think a lot of successful preparation for a litigation is really being prepared in advance and not panicking and responding appropriately. And then there's also a whole set we could talk about of what's in the legal arsenal. Once you have to bring in the lawyers and they're starting to structure the defense, thematically, it will focus on this notion that, yes, there was good, robust security, but that doesn't mean perfect security that there's risk inherent is sort of choosing to be part of the digital world. You know, the only way to really be safe is to unplug everything and not put anything out there, but nobody wants to live their lives that way. Um, and then the legal set of defenses that go along with that, that focus, I think, appropriately on not whether or not there's perfect security, but whether there was reasonable security. I would just add um, the incident response plan is very important. You don't really have an incident response plan until you've had it tested with a third party tabletop exercise. Okay. So you want to do a tabletop exercise at least annually. You want to test specific scenarios that the company is likely to face, whether it's ransomware, or data breach or uh, insider theft situation. Um, and uh, when you go through it each year, uh, this is an opportunity to see what's working and what's not working with the plan and to update it. Don't just kind of shelf you know, shelf that exercise, like, all right, we did well, or we, we didn't do so well. Make sure it's worked into the plan. Uh, and, and by the way, as long as we're talking about incident response plans, make sure you have a hard copy of the incident response plan, because if all your systems are encrypted because of ransomware, your incident response plan will also be encrypted and, and not particularly helpful. Yeah, good, good point. And make sure you update it. it. It doesn't help you, as Brian says, if you're locked out from it or you never take it out and use it. So it's important that that you use it also. Um, so those are all some, I agree, Brian, some important tips to have. And, you know, it's a double edged sword. I agree absolutely that you have to have tabletop exercises. Also, you know, the types of things you'll be asked in litigation if and when you face it is, do you have a bug bounty program? Do you have a red team or an off offensive team that regularly, you know, does these kind of drills? Do you use third parties to do it? And the answer typically, depending on the size of your company, should be yes. However, the flip of that is for every time the red team successfully executes an attack, for every time that a table talk exercise goes sideways, you have to show that you're incorporating, as Brian said, the learnings from those exercises. Otherwise, what you're left with is the worst of all worlds, which is you got the signal and you did nothing about it. Right. Yeah, right. I mean, and I would just say on that particular point, I've dealt with that point in front of juries. That, did you do this? Did you do that? Did you do this? The, the, and I successfully defended that with the basic answer is there's always more you can do in terms of cybersecurity. The test is what you did do, what measures you did have in place, not what measures you didn't have in place, because you could go on forever on that. Yeah, all, all great points. Um, and just having done um, uh, diligence myself of uh, about 500 companies now, it's it's still amazing how many how many companies uh, don't do the basics on the IR plan and the tabletops. And so I know these are sort of fundamental concepts, but it's just something that, um, you know, we don't see all that often. So just putting it on the calendar, taking the time to walk through 
um, the plan and take lessons learned, you know, it's critically important. Um, I mean, the you, teams are, to be fair, these security teams are burdened with real life challenges every single all, day. So sometimes that next step of prophylactic measures and test measures are hard to work in. And that's why I agree with you, John. It needs to be something that's intentional and built into the calendar in order to make sure it happens. Yeah. Okay. Um, and can you take us through maybe some legal defenses that are working uh, uh, for companies? Uh, I know yeah. And, you know, I will confess in advance, thing. I have a deep and wide law geek street. So I'll try to like, I'll try to put it at the practical level for everyone. So here's the thing, when it comes to data breach litigation, usually the facts regarding the breach are, the, are, are sort of not as in much dispute. We can characterize them like, does that show an absence of reasonable security or not, but the facts are the facts, right? So where we get into the legal arguments is, okay, a breach happened, sure, but what does it mean? You know, and so the real battleground, uh, the legal battleground for many of these cases is proving damages. And that's an area that's evolving and getting the, a lot of focus by courts and, and sort of their, their mixed results here. So damages can come up at the very beginning of a case and often do in a concept that's called standing. And what standing means is have you met the minimum threshold to show that there's a case or controversy in federal court, for instance, the standard requires three things. Number one, you have to show that there was um, a conduct that resulted in damage. That damage has to be fairly traceable to the event. And then it has to, as I said, result in damage. So showing those two components that it's, quote, fairly traceable and resulting in damage has been a really center stage for a lot of the data breach litigation Early on, I think courts were more hesitant to find that there wasn't damage. So they thought the very fact that a bad actor got in and took information, that shows that something bad's going to happen. But with, given the more you know, proliferation of breaches, I think courts are now taking a more exacting approach to standing and asking, all right, yes, there is a breach, but do we know that there is going to be resulting damage or is it simply hypothetical? And when you look at the spectrum of possibility of damages, I think now where the cases are shaking out is you look at the type of data that's been exposed. So if it's what I would call phone book data, in other words, things that are published you know, freely and frequently and doesn't really seem to be core to the you know, heart of privacy, things like your name or even your birthday, but it, there's no financial information, there's no social security number, uh, or any of those things, I think the court is more skeptical to claims of potential damage. Now, even the Ninth Circuit, which is, uh, I think, sort of notoriously pro-plaintiff, just last month had a decision and a name that I will no doubt get wrong, but it's Prishniki. And in that case, the court said, you know, it was a case where there were allegations of this type of telephone book data being exposed. And the court said, you know, I understand it concerns you and you may have even spent time or enrolled in monitoring programs that you voluntarily enrolled in, but that doesn't qualify as damages. Increase in spam, increase in annoyance phone calls, the, the pure claim that your PII has somehow been diminished because it's been exposed. The courts are increasingly skeptical of those kind of claims and they fall under the defense of either standing or lack of damages. So layer on top of that, another concept, which is if you can't prove damages, what about where there's financial data exposed? Well, there too, even if, for instance, credit card information has been exposed, if you say in your complaint, for instance, that the charges was, were reimbursed by the company, that you canceled your credit card, or that, uh, for instance, the, the CCV number is not included, all those things sort of cut off the possibility of future harm, right? Because now you're not using that credit card, your numbers change, you've changed your password, or, or not everything has been exposed that would allow a bad actor to use that information. There too, courts are increasingly scrutinizing that. So the real focus and where defendants have received traction, I think, in many of these cases is early on, very clearly focusing on the data elements and whether those data elements can be used to cause the type of harm that the law considers compensable. 
Yeah, and I would just add there that uh, in April of this year, April 26, uh, to be specific, um, the Second Circuit sort of joined all the circuits who have uh, opined on the standing question in a case that's slightly easier to pronounce, uh, Devon <laughs> McMorris versus Carlos Lopez and Associates, LLC. Um, and basically what the Second Circuit decided was uh, consistent with it, what Anne Marie said, the Ninth Circuit decided and other circuits decided, but significantly they said there's no real dispute amongst the circuits on how this standing argument plays out, that there's general agreement. Um, so that is a, a good defense for companies uh, to keep in their back pocket and to take out as soon as they need it. And it's not only a good legal defense, it makes practical sense, right? Yeah. Because what we've been trying to navigate as the track record over data breach litigation matures is now we've gotten past the point where the mere fact of a breach should expose you to liability. And now we're taking, as I think the law requires, a closer look at can you causally connect the, the causal dots and show that there was actual damage that resulted from that data breach as opposed to other potential breaches and or was the information exposed to the type of information that can be used to actually do harm? Right, more than just a generalized worry about how it could come back on somebody someday. Right, I mean, and again, I think the pendulum has swung somewhat and what started as more a circuit split is now we see the circuits more aligned and taking that closer look. Yeah, great. Uh, and, I, and we have a case citation uh, in the materials we received, too, which talks about that a little bit. Uh, another case where there was a standing defense that I think illustrates the, all the points that uh, Anne was making earlier. OK, um, enough of that. Let's go back in the bungling. Um, Brian, is there a way that uh, a breach response could be bungled in such a manner that um, somebody in the company goes to jail rather than the hacker who caused the breach? Well, you'd have to really bungle it pretty bad, John, in order for the result to be that you go to jail <laughs> and not the criminal. Um, so is it, hypothetical. it's not a hypothetical discussion. But but there are, there are a couple of circumstances that I can't think of that it's theoretically possible. It's not, not that common. I don't want anyone uh, staying up at night worrying about it. Uh, but th three examples I can think of. Uh, one is the Uber example. There's a recent indictment against the former CISO of Uber, and we can talk about that. It's very fact specific. I don't think it has to concern people too much, but it could be a reoccurring fact pattern. So we should make sure we know what that's about. Um, a second one is the OFAC guidance regarding ransomware. Um, OFAC specifically indicated that um, uh, that there's certain payments, you can't make ransomware payments to certain um, ransomware groups. And while that's probably not going to result in criminal prosecution, um, it could result in civil enforcement. So that wouldn't be, a, that would be a bungle too. Right. Um, and, and then the third example, and this one could result in criminal enforcement. Hey, yeah. Just, just to clarify, OFAC, for anybody who doesn't know, is an extension of the Treasury Department, which is the enfor enforcement arm that goes after uh, some of the bad guys with Treasury Treasury related sanctions, just to give a little bit of context to what you were saying. Yeah, no, absolutely. Thank you, John. Or to interrupt. Then, no, no, no problem. And then the third one that I can think of is hackback. Uh, you know, if you respond to a hack by hacking back, then you're also potentially breaking federal criminal law and civil law and Theoretically, that could also result in prosecution. All right. So um, I know there was um, a, a bit of a stir about the Uber indictment. Um, so do we want to go through the facts of that? And as you mentioned, Brian, it's, it is very fact specific. Um, and what the implications of that case are, I think it helps for the audience to understand what exactly happened there. Yes, yeah, sure. So uh, we'll go over to the high level because we only have so much time. Yeah. But essentially what happened here was that uh, Uber was allegedly breached by a attacker slash security researcher. They usually go by both uh, in terms of if you ask them what the profession is. And specifically, their, their software repository, which was on a site like GitHub, it might have been GitHub, but it was on a, a site like that and was configured in such a way that the attacker was able to get in. The attacker threatened to uh, make the code public, 
and to make the hack public unless they were paid as part of the bug bounty program. So as part of the bug bounty program or the vulnerability disclosure program, the CISO uh, engineered a payment of something like $100,000 to the hacker, which was 10 times the amount that the policy allowed them to pay a hacker under the policy, under the vulnerability disclosure program policy. And they entered into an NDA with a hacker that basically said the hacker was agreeing not to tell anyone that they were able to breach and get Uber's code uh, or get Uber's, uh, they were actually able to get Uber's um, driver's names, uh, license uh, information, a lot of PII associated with the Uber drivers. So he signed this NDA even though Uber's policy uh, as part of the bug bounty program said that the security researcher could make it public that they did whatever they did. Now, that doesn't necessarily seem like it would rise to a criminal indictment. And indeed, based on those facts, it may not have been a criminal indictment. What made it a criminal indictment was that Uber had suffered a breach several years earlier that occurred in almost the exact same manner. Right. And, the, and the FTC, the Federal Trade Commission, was investigating that breach. And Uber and its CISO and its outside counsel were making all kinds of representations in order to settle that uh, ongoing FTC investigation. And the defense, part of Uber's defense seemed to be that um, we learned our lesson. We'll never make that mistake again. Um, and so you guys should limit any fine, limit you know, whatever kind of penalty you're going to give us to something very minimal and, and you should move on. So they were in the process of sort of making that defense. Hey, we've learned our lesson, never going to happen when the exact same thing happened again. And so it was the impression of the FBI that issued this criminal complaint um, and presumably the attorneys, the AUSAs or prosecutors with whom they were working, that that was a material uh, omission and that they did not provide any information about uh, the current hack to the FTC and that the statements they did make to the FTC were somewhat misleading um, in light of what had happened. Now, I will say uh, you never want to make a, a misrepresentation or omission in front of a government agency. You don't want to come close to that line. If you have to ask yourself, is this misleading? Is this overly misleading? If you have to ask yourself, if you have to ask your counsel, my advice is to just disclose it, because if you have to ask, it, it, it's going to be um, you don't want to take the risk. If you had to ask, a judge might have to ask to a jury might have to ask to they might all find you should have disclosed it. That being said, fr from the information that was disclosed in the criminal complaint, this is a, this seems to me, in my opinion, to be a fairly aggressive use of uh, of this prosecution authority. Um, and I. I I'm not sure how, if it ends up going all the way to a jury trial, I'm not even sure how the jury would come out on it. I'm not sure whether whether they would be convicted, this former CISO would be convicted or acquitted. I think it's a bit of an open question. Yeah, but your point um, about not getting close to the line or anywhere near the line, I think that's a great rule of thumb, similar to Anne's um, New York City billboard doctrine about uh, breach communications, right? Uh, if you have to ask yourself whether or not uh, it could be perceived as withholding or um, deceptive or uh, under underrepresenting, under disclosing, then uh, that's probably what you really need to know as a guiding principle. Agreed. Okay. Um, so uh, again, this part, and I think there was a question about um, question about the deck. Um, we do have some um, uh, actionable recommendations that you can take away when you're able to access the materials. Um, so we we put things out for you that touch on all these topics that we talked about, um, including updating incident response plans for OFAC um, guidance. Um, how you can protect yourself from a situation like Uber, um, thinking about privilege, incorporating that into your practices um, related to incident re response reports. And so you'll see all that in the materials um, that we mentioned. Um, 
Ryan, Ann, what else do we need to talk about? Yeah, I think, again, boy, we're, we're in very quickly sort of in a tsunami of words, though, saying all these things you need to do and get them right. Otherwise, you're going to have potentially a bungled breach response. You know, there's never a perfect scenario when you find yourself in a breach situation. All you can do is focus on risk containment and risk mitigation. There's no such thing as risk elimination. So take that burden off your shoulders. Let's start there. But I think, as I said before, some of this comes down to muscle memory and being prepared. So you, uh, you know, the old saying goes, you hope for the best, but you prepare for the worst. I think that can't be truer than in the breach context. And so the first thing I think you need to do is think about this in graduated steps. If you find yourself in a breach situation, you know, think of it in graduated steps like you do your incident response plan. And the first thing you do, of course, is to identify what the incident is, capture the information you can related to it. Um, but remember always uh, that hindsight's twenty twenty. but one of the first questions you'll be asked in litigation is, did you pay attention to the signals? And those include signals from law enforcement, signals from, you know, the gray hack hacking community or from security vendors like you, you're going to be held to the standard of what information about risks and vulnerability was aware uh, available to you. And sort of this crosses over to, I think, the point Brian was making that while I agree that Uber situation is very fact specific and um, it should be both something that doesn't keep you up at night, but is a cautionary tale. It might also be a good recommendation to establish a relationship with law enforcement, right? Because that can be a proactively helpful thing too. So in addition to, to having those relationships, paying attention to the security uh, community, including gray hat and white hat hackers, make sure you're mobilizing your response team at the first sign of trouble, and then start thinking about, okay, I need to make sure all the stakeholders, including your trusted legal advisors are involved because you're gonna, from the get-go, wanna make sure you don't do things that create downstream litigation risk in addition to the fact of the breach itself. And so what do I mean by that? I mean that you wanna consider and protect the privilege in the ways that we've been talking about. You wanna make sure uh, what you have, for instance, a legal hold, what does that mean? Yes, as much as we worry about the communications, the reality is once there is litigation, you have to preserve those communications or you find yourself in trouble. You wanna consider all your possible reporting obligations. So that means there's an alphabet soup of possible regulators involved and you need to make sure you're considering all of that. So at the end of the day, a lot of this comes down to communication and appropriate escalation, which should be built into your incident response plan to make sure as a security team, you don't wanna be siloed. That is a very lonely place to be and it's a place that creates risk. So you want to make sure the appropriate internal stakeholders are involved early on and, and therefore you make sure the lines of communication are open. So those are some of the things that I think about right away when trying to consider how do I make sure that a bad situation doesn't get worse and get away from me? Yep, absolutely. Great points. Um, and Brian, I think um, we, we could also talk a little bit more. We uh, I know you mentioned them, but we could talk a little bit more about Hackback and OFAC and build that out a little bit more. Yes. Yeah, sure, sure. So uh, first on Hackback, uh, that's another way you can end up on the wrong side of the law. So, I, you know, people talk about this as though it's a big problem. Like companies are advocating through certain uh, cyber lawyers. They really need the ability to hack back. Um, First of all, they're envisioning a scenario that almost never comes up, that may not have ever come up. They're envisioning a scenario, for example, where their trade secret is stolen and they discover by a hacker, and they discover that it's sitting out there on a server just waiting for them to hack into that server and just take it back. Now, well, it sounds that, appealing, Brian. I mean, it sounds like it would be a fun thing to do, so why yeah. not? So it does, it, it, does, it, does sound, it does sound appealing. Um, and companies say, oh, we need the right the ability to do this. All right. So courts always discourage self-help. We know That's that right. as we know that as lawyers. Um, and I'm by the way, not encouraging it myself. I was being right. I was being a little flip there. So yeah, we, we we know that as lawyers, and we know it, it, it violates, it potentially violates the Computer Fraud and Abuse Act. And while you think you might be reaching out 
to the criminal's computer, the criminal almost always acts through another infected computer or server. So you're most likely reaching out, you would most likely be reaching out to an innocent party's uh, server and trespassing and hacking their server. But as a practical matter, there's really no need for this. Um, Anne-Marie made a really good point in terms of getting law enforcement, getting developing relationships with law enforcement in advance of a breach. And that's super important. We always recommend developing a relationship with uh, your local cyber agent. So you go on the FBI's website, find the field office nearest to you or to your client, and have a conversation in advance. Get to meet a cyber agent such that you have their personal information their card with you at all times. Brian, uh, they can be great sources of information to help you respond to breaches, don't you think? Exactly. They can be uh, really helpful. And the thing is, what, what we found is if, if you have no relationship in advance, if you have a ransomware attack, you have anything and you reach out, you may hear nothing in the time frame that you would need to be for it to be helpful. Um, whereas if you have a personal relationship in this hackback example, you can reach out right away and the office that I was with with the DOJ, the Computer Crime uh, and Intellectual Property Section, CSIPS, has worked with the FBI to develop the capability to get a very fast warrant or use exigent circumstances to quickly go in and do what they need to do if one of these unusual circumstances occurred. If it's an exigent circumstance situation, the FBI can just take over your account and go in and get the thing. Um, under exigent circumstances, potentially, and it would be legal for them to do it where it would be a crime for you to do the exact same thing. So it usually makes sense to, to let the FBI lead in that effort. And if you have their contact information available, you could do that pretty easily. The last thing, I'm just going to jump right into uh, OFAC as well, because we only have two minutes. Two minute OFAC. Yeah. So yeah. as John mentioned, that's the Office of Foreign Asset Control with the Treasury. And they can sanction particular groups, particular individuals, particular countries, and make it illegal for you to do any transactions with them. They've done that with respect to ransomware and with respect to specific ransomware actors. And that means that if you make the payment to those groups, to those actors, then you can be strictly liable. That's what the OFAC has said, strictly liable, even if you didn't know that those were uh, sanctioned groups or sanctioned individuals or sanctioned entities. So, uh, and if you're strictly liable, you'd potentially be a, facing a significant penalty uh, by the Treasury Department. It hasn't happened yet, but the Treasury Department has made it clear that they are willing to do that and they are ready to do it. So if you are even considering, first of all, if you have a ransomware attack or any cyber attack where you're considering making a payment to the bad actor, you definitely want to consult with outside breach council who specializes in this area before doing it. And you want to be very careful about making payments to any organization that could be on that list. Okay, terrific. Well, um, I know we're running up on time. So um, I just wanted to say for everybody who attended, really great to have you on board. Um, appreciate the questions and the comments along the way. Um, Brian and Ann, really appreciate you uh, being such great panelists and leading a very stimulating discussion. We covered a lot of ground, but hopefully I think, you know, very useful, very actionable, um, getting people caught up on, on some of the legal policy and, and uh, other considerations happening in cybersecurity today. Uh, Brian, Ann, any closing comments? Anything else that uh, you'd like our audience to understand? I mean, that was a lot of information in a short period of time, and they should feel free to reach out with any kind of questions if anyone has them. But, you know, you guys have a tough job. I have a lot of respect for you, and our job is to make your job easier. Uh, last thing, uh, that's a great point, Anne. I agree. The last thing I'll say is that uh, consistent with what we've been saying, the best thing you can do today, you can start now, is prepare for this sort of thing to happen. And there's, there's at least two aspects to that. One is for all of your clients and for your firms as well, um, make sure you're getting a cybersecurity assessment, a comprehensive cybersecurity assessment to understand what are the strengths and weaknesses of your program and opportunities to improve before something happens. Maybe it'll prevent a big incident, but even if it doesn't, you're gonna be a much better position with courts and regulators if you've taken that step in advance and work towards any um, remediations that need to be made. That's the first point. And the second point, as we've talked about in terms of preparation, is you have an incident response plan, um, test it regularly, and um, 
be, be prepared to use it. Take it out the moment something happens. Don't start improvising and having communication. Okay, terrific. Um, well, thank you again. Uh, I know that uh, we could have gone on for quite a bit longer on these topics, but um, again, feel like we had a great discussion and uh, hope everybody is able to enjoy the rest of the conference. Thanks everyone. Thank Take you. Care.